Pardon? Yeah, I'm going to talk about a slightly different approach to approximate quantum error correction, and one that now includes uh, the framework of operator error correction as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm currently at uh, the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in India, uh, but this is work that was done while I was still at uh, IQI Caltech, and uh, joint work with uh, Hui Kuhn. So I'm going to actually begin by telling you about this very interesting and useful quantum channel called the transpose channel, which uh, Cedric briefly mentioned in his talk. Um, and I'm going to tell you about the role it plays in perfect error correction first, and then briefly um, review some of our earlier results where we approach the problem of approximate subspace error correction using the transpose channel. And I'll show you uh, some examples of some good approximate codes uh, that we managed to find using this approach. And with this background, I'm going to move on to subsystem codes um, and tell you about approximate operator quantum error correction and show you um, that using the transpose channel provides a nice um, unifying framework for approximate correction. So what is this transpose channel? Um, so given um, a noise channel in a code space, uh, you can construct this quantum channel, uh, which for historical reasons is now called the transpose channel. Um, the Krauss elements of this channel are simply given, um, as I've written it down here, P is simply the projection onto the code, and EI dagger are simply the adjoint of the error operators of the noise channel. And though I've written down this channel uh, in terms of its Krauss elements, um, this is act the channel itself is actually completely independent of the Krauss representation because it really can be thought of as a composition of these three channels. Essentially, the transpose channel is simply the adjoint of the noise channel with two additional maps, P and N, added along to make this channel, uh, to normalize this channel. It's trace preserving on the support of the action of the noise on the code. Um, and so why should one um, be interested in this channel? Because it has been known for a while that if a noise channel is perfectly correctable on a code, um, then the transpose channel is indeed the recovery map that recovers the information contained in the code. Now, the way it's written down here, it of course looks completely different from the way one is used to seeing the perfect recovery map in terms of projections and unit trees, but it's easy to show that these two maps are in fact exactly the same. Perhaps the role of the transpose channel in perfect error correction will become more explicit uh, when we look at this alternate form of writing down the perfect error correction conditions. Um, so what we uh, showed a while back is that the knill leflamme conditions are exactly equivalent to this other set of algebraic conditions. Notice that the left-hand side of this condition simply consists of the Krauss operators of E followed by the transpose channel. And once we realize this, um, it's, it is easy to see what this condition implies. So what this condition implies is that if this um, channel is actually correctable on the code, then it means that the action of this composite channel should simply be a projection on the code. And so um, this way of writing down the perfect error correction conditions in some sense makes the re recovery operation very clear. And what it helps us do is to also immediately obtain sufficient conditions for approximate correction. Because all we need to do now is to really perturb this condition. And what we can show is that the size of the perturbation is directly related to the fidelity that you obtain on using the transpose channel. And because of this realization, we now have a set of easily checkable conditions for approximate subspace correction. So before I proceed, I should tell you um, how I, we define approximation. Um, Cedric has already given a nice introduction and some motivation for the problem of approximate error correction. Um, but the measure that we use to quantify approximate correctability is something slightly different. Uh, we use something called, uh, we use what we call the worst case fidelity which for us is simply um, a minimization over all states in the code space of this overlap between the initial state and the final state after the action of both the channel um, and the recovery. And uh, it's sometimes easy to think in terms of the fidelity laws or the infidelity, and we'll in fact state some of our bounds in terms of this fidelity laws. So of course we define, um, we say that a channel is approximately correctable if um, this worst case fidelity um, is close to one or is, is high. So notice that finding the optimal recovery in this case um, for this worst case fidelity as I've defined it here is in fact not a convex optimization problem. 
But of course, one can use other measures uh, which make the problem tractable, say semi-definite programming or convex optimization, and this has already been done. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, it has been shown that um, a channel which looks very similar to the way the transpose channel uh, was written down um, is close to optimal for the entanglement fidelity measure. And analytically, uh, we just saw that uh, close to optimal recovery maps can also be constructed for the worst case entanglement fidelity. But what we are really interested in is the problem of approximate correctability with worst case fidelity, uh, which really minimizes this fidelity function for all states in the code space. And the first thing, um, the, the, the key result that we obtained here was to show that the transpose channel is actually close to optimal for the worst case fidelity measure that I just defined. So just to state the result more precisely, um, for a given code space of dimension D, if eta op is the fidelity loss uh, for the optimal recovery map, then the fidelity due to, uh, on using the transpose channel is close to the fidelity that you obtain with the optimal map, and it only deviates from the optimal fidelity by a factor of d. So this corollary essentially sums up the fact that the fidelity loss or the infidelity due to the transpose channel is very close to the fidelity due to the optimal map modulo this factor of dimension. And once we have um, this, this bound on the, uh, opti the uh, near optimality of the transpose channel, in some sense we essentially have, oh well, so yeah, I wanted to make this point here that um, if the optimal fidelity is actually zero, uh, sorry, if the optimal fidelity loss is actually zero, uh, which means we are now in the setting of perfect error correction, then you see that the fidelity loss due to the transpose channel is exactly eta op, which once again reinforces the point that for perfect error correction, um, the transpose channel is indeed the optimal recovery map. So what I was going to say was that this bound on the near optimality of the transpose channel, together with what I mentioned earlier about sufficient conditions, um, essentially gives us a somewhat complete picture for approximate subspace error correction. We now have necessary and sufficient conditions for approximate correctability, and we can use these to actually search for good codes for specific noise models. So I'm going to show you now um, some examples of codes that we obtained for the amplitude damping channel. So what I plot here is the worst case fidelity as a function of the damping parameter gamma. Um, so the red curve here with the, the crosses is essentially the fidelity uh, due to the 513 perfect stabilizer code. The black line here, the solid black line and the solid blue line are essentially approximate four qubit codes. Notice that these approximate four qubit codes actually uh, pretty well compared to the uh, exact 5-1 code. And in fact, uh, the blue line actually uh, outperforms the perfect 5-1 code uh, for some values of gamma. So the blue line uses an approximate 4-1 code, and, but uses a numerically optimized recovery. It uses um, a, numer a recovery the map that's obtained using semi-definite programming for the case of entanglement fidelity. And the black line here uses the same approximate 4-1 code, but with the transpose channel recovery. So notice that the transpose channel recovery, in fact, performs um, almost as well as a numerically optimized recovery. And both of these approximate codes actually perform um, very close to the perfect five qubit code. So one reason, to, uh, one way to understand why this might be happening is because if you recall, the five qubit code is, of course, a generic code which is constructed to correct for any single qubit error, whereas these approximate codes, uh, this particular approximate 41 code read by Debbie Long and others in, uh, uh, a while back, uh, this has actually been constructed specifically for the amplitude damping channel. So in some sense, what we're comparing is a generic um, code versus a code that has actually been tailor-made for a particular channel, and that might explain why these codes actually outperform the perfect 5 qubit code for some time. Um, what we did was to look for even shorter codes. Um, so using um, the transpose channel recovery, we actually searched at random for um, three qubit codes and two qubit codes for the amplitude damping channel. So what I'm comparing here, this solid red line is the perfect 5 qubit code. Uh, the dashed black line is a random uh, four qubit code uh, just generated by some random numerical search. Uh, with the transpose channel recovery, the solid blue line again is a random three qubit code, and this is a random two qubit code. 
And this uh, result was really surprising because what it's showing us is that even a random search can give you, in fact, very short codes which don't perform that badly compared to the five qubit code. And we managed to go all the way down to even two qubit codes which perform, well, reasonably okay considering that you've gone from five to all the way down to two qubits. Anyway, so with this sort of background of our results on approximate subspace codes, the natural question was to go ahead and ask, what about subsystem codes? Can you actually um, extend this um, framework to include subsystem codes as well? And how well does the transpose channel actually perform um, in the case of operator quantum error correction? So that's what we're going to talk about next. Uh, we're all familiar with the formalism of operator quantum error correction. The idea is um, that, the, the, that a physical noise um, induces a certain partition on our system Hilbert space and information is only encoded in a subsystem of this larger Hilbert space. So the recovery map only recovers um, subsystem A and does not really care about uh, states in the other subsystem B which I like to think of as a noisy subsystem and I like to think of subsystem A as a correctable subsystem. So the first thing to do um, was to really um, look at how well does the transport channel do for perfect operator error correction. And it turns out that um, it is, in fact, uh, that we obtain a result exactly identical to what we had in the subspace case, um, that we can, in fact, come up with alternate conditions for perfect operator error correction. And these alternate conditions are again written down if you notice on the left-hand side, um, uh, we again have cross operators of the channel followed by those of the transpose channel. And uh, so in some sense, uh, we now have a result which tells us that the transpose channel is indeed the appropriate recovery map, even for perfect operator error correction. Um, so in some sense, subsystem A is perfect if and only if uh, the action of the noise channel followed by the transpose channel is a simple projection on subsystem A. So once we, ha once we understood the role of the transpose channel for perfect operator error correction, um, the next thing uh, to do was to immediately obtain sufficient conditions for approximate operator error correction. So uh, we have, uh, so, so um, the noise channel E is epsilon correctable on subsystem A, uh, provided the cross operator satisfied this algebraic condition, where delta um, is, is a perturbation uh, whose size is bounded by this noise threshold epsilon. So the reason that um, I called uh, the, the, the sort of intuition behind the fact that these are sufficient conditions for approximate correction is this following observation again. The size of this perturbation delta, so this quantity, uh, the trace norm of these deltas, is directly to the worst case fidelity um, on using the transpose channel. Notice that the worst case fidelity measure is a little different here because what we are comparing is states in subsystem A to the final state which is traced out over subsystem B after the action of both the noise and the transpose channel. So these are sufficient conditions for approximate operator error correction. And once we have these conditions, again, these are easily checkable conditions. So it's very easy now to actually search for good um, subsystem codes as well similar to how we search for good approximate subspace codes, but this is only part of the story. The next question to ask is what about the optimality of the transpose channel? How well does the transpose channel actually perform for a generic um, non-perfectly correcting subsystem code and noise channel? And it turns out that we can only answer this question partially uh, in the sense that we can show that the transpose channel is close to optimal only for certain special kinds of subsystem codes. So I'm going to do, uh, just quickly run through what these special cases are for which we can show that the transpose channel is close to optimal. So the first is, of course, the completely trivial case where your noise channel is just a completely, uh, is completely decoupled. The action of the noise channel is completely decoupled between the two subsystems. And then it's easy to see that the transpose channel is, of course, approximately correcting because that just follows from our subspace result. But the more interesting case where we show that the transpose channel is close to optimal is the case where subsystem B actually starts out in a maximally mixed state. Recall that subsystem B is our noisy subsystem, the subsystem on which we are not interested, we really don't care about what happens to the information in subsystem B. So this may not be that bad um, a situation after all. So uh, when subsystem B starts out in a maximally mixed state, what we can show is that the fidelity due to the transpose channel is very close to the optimal fidelity. Eta op is again the fidelity loss for the optimal recovery map as we defined earlier. 
Notice that the factor of dimension is only the dimension of subsystem A, uh, which is as it should be, because any bound with, which has the factor, uh, dimension of subsystem B appearing in it would, be, would really not be very meaningful. And if we try to just trivially extend our subspace result to the subsystem result, then I should tell you that invariably you end up picking up a factor of the dimension of subsystem B. So this bound is in some sense quite a non-trivial bound. And of course, we're able to show this only when um, the system B starts out in the maximally mixed state, which is another way of saying that we just don't know anything about the state in subsystem B. I should tell you about another interesting special case. So if you look at just qubit codes, in an independent error model, by which I mean that the errors occur, um, occur independently on each qubit and are picked in an IID fashion. And if the error operators on the noisy subsystem are simply scaled Pauli operators, then we can actually show that the fidelity due to the transpose channel is completely independent of the state on subsystem B. It's an important case because it pretty much um, covers um, the case of um, subsystem stabilizer codes where really you are in a qubit setting and where your error operators are all scaled Pauli's and you are in an independent error model uh, sort of situation. Then this is really, uh, this really nice result tells us that um, the fidelity due to the transpose channel is completely independent of the state on subsystem B and so our bound here completely carries through. So we really don't need to bother about starting on the maximum limit state on B. So a final um, scenario where um, the transpose channel is again close to optimal is the case, is a sort of extreme case where um, the noise channel completely destroys most of the information in subsystem B. What do I mean by that? So if the action of the noise channel has the following property, which I write down in this last line here, so the action on, on subsystem B is to actually bring any two states on subsystem B close together. What I've written down here, this bound is specifically for mixed state, but you can, in fact, replace this by any fixed state on subsystem B, and this result would still go through. The idea is that the channel really um, contracts, in some sense, subsystem B, and if delta is this contracting uh, parameter, then we again have a near optimality result, but with, a, with, with, of course, this additional parameter of delta figuring in there. So again, there's a large class of physical channels for which this is true. So if the noise channel is, for example, strictly contractive on subsystem B with a really small delta, which means it's strongly contracting on subsystem B, then again, we know that we can recover with high fidelity using the transpose channel. And this time, we can recover no matter what state we started out with on subsystem B. Um, and of course, note that such a condition is also another way of saying that this noise channel is close to unentangling between subsystem A and B. So let me just summarize um, what I've said here. So what I've done is a simple and unifying approach to approximate error correction based on the transpose channel. So by understanding the role that the transpose channel plays in perfect error correction, both subspace and subsystem leads us to sufficient conditions for approximate error correction. And uh, this, also, this, this also leads us to a simple way to check when a given code is approximately correctable. It helps us to find approximate codes of even shorter lengths. And the most interesting thing is that it compares favorably with codes that are obtained via numerical optimization. So that brings us to our bounds on the near optimality of the transpose channel. We have established that the transpose channel is near optimal for subspace codes. For subsystem codes, uh, we are only able to show the near optimality under some restrictive conditions, but these conditions do uh, capture a large class of physically relevant codes and physically relevant channels. Uh, let me just leave you with some open questions. Um, it's of course, um, it would be nice if uh, we could actually um, find channels um, which really get rid of this factor of dimension um, that's sitting in our bounds. Of course, if you're just interested in correcting for single qubit errors, then this factor of dimension is just three, and so that's really not much. But if you want to look at larger codes, then maybe this factor of dimension is a little annoying. Um, but a more interesting question, and a more pressing question probably, is whether this is how to implement this transpose channel in a more efficient manner. Uh, what do I mean by efficient? Uh, so of course, it's uh, clear that you can always implement uh, the transpose channel. I've just written down the definition here again. It's, it's clear that you can always implement this uh, via some kind of generalized measurement followed by a conditional unitary. Uh, but the question is, is there a more uh, clever way of implementing the transpose channel, considering that it is, in some sense, just the adjoint of the noise channel itself? So can we make use of some implementation of the noise channel itself to implement uh, the transpose channel? That would be a very interesting and challenging uh, question. 
And of course, there's always the notion of whether you can really use approximate error correction as some kind of first step in a fault-tolerant architecture. Well, thanks for listening, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Okay. Questions? Mark. Is it easy to implement for a Pali channel uh, to recover a Pali channel? Or like certain channels, do you know if it's easy to implement the transpose channel for correcting a, a Pali channel? Um, but like then an for a Pali channel, channel um, uh, you really uh, probably uh, are not interested in doing approximate error correction because uh, the st uh, so the so the, the the reason that one looks at one looked at the amplitude damping channel for example is that if you look at the error operators of the amplitude damping channel then they are really not scaled Pauli operators so um, it's it's it somehow pays to actually do approximate error correction rather than just use a stabilizer for channels like the amplitude damping channel for the case of Pauli channels. Um, so when your channel is unital, which is what would happen um, for Pauli channels, I think it is very easy to implement uh, the transpose channel, actually. But I think the more interesting case is the non-trivial case um, of channels like the amplitude damping channel, where you really don't have just scaled Pauli operators. Okay. You don't know how to do it for the amplitude damping channel? Uh, no, I haven't. So, so one can, of course, implement, like I just told you, so you can implement this. For, right. for example, if you want to do a four qubit, um, if you wanted to do a four qubit code for the amplitude damping channel, you would just have to use um, 16 ancillas, and then you would be able to implement this um, using these uh, POVMs and conditional unitaries. But yeah, that's, that's about it. Okay. All right, Todd had a question. Uh, let me squeeze in real fast. I had a question about what do you mean by efficiently here? Is that in, in terms of a quantum circuit? Is that yeah, what you mean? I mean a quantum circuit. But but hang on a second. If you could do that efficiently always, couldn't you do amazing things like solving hidden subgroup problems? I remember at the end of Bonham and Kindle's paper, uh -huh. they have a connection to hidden subgroups. Right, you could right, essentially implement PGMs. Right. And then yeah, solve. It, it is very, yeah, it is so, exactly pretty so good measurement and all that. Yeah. Additional constraints maybe in mind or about the, ch the channels or the, about the codes you're considering when you say efficiently? Or? Yeah, so what I really had in mind is what I just told you, that this is really the adjoint of the noise channel. Right. So if there was a way to do this, um, so if you, have an if you have an efficient circuit implementation of the noise channel itself, then can you sort of, uh, uh, maybe can you at least obtain bounds on how to uh, uh, implement the transpose channel? Based on that. Based on, that based on a circuit implementation, okay. implementation of the noise channel itself. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, so the way I generally think about operator codes, the uh, noisy subsystem mm -hmm. is something that you're, you've sort of deliberately given up looking at in mm -hmm. order to, uh, you know, either gain some, uh, some ability to simplify your operations or, or, or for whatever reason, or because you can't look at it. Mm -hmm. So in that case, generally I would, if I were going to ascribe a state to it at all, I would ascribe the maximally, the maximally mixed state. So if you're not doing that, it seems like you may be kind of cheating, right? I mean, if, if you have more information about that system, that is, you're in a, in a state that's less than maximally mixed, then you can sneak a little extra information about the error by looking at the noisy system. Mm -hmm. So then you're not exactly doing an operator code, you're, you're kind of doing an, uh, a normal code, but in a, in a somewhat imperfect way. So, uh, it, it, I mean, so does the fact that, that you can't show optimality for, you know, for, for cases where, where you can get extra information in this way just reflect the fact that it isn't really a, acting like a proper operator code? So the way we had thought about it was actually the other way around. So when you try to fix a state in the noisy subsystem, there is, you can actually think of what you're doing um, simply in terms of subspace error correction then. Because you've really reduced your subsystem B to some kind of trivial uh, subsystem. And so if I completely fix my state in the noisy subsystem, then am I not losing um, the subsystem structure? Which is why we try to look for bounds where it's not just the maximally mixed state, but any state. Um, but the other point is, in a, 
well, in an ideal setting, it's true. You, you actually don't know anything about the noisy subsystem, and so it probably makes sense to just model it with a maximally mixed state. But in a real uh, life, in a real system, you probably have, are going to have some leakage of information into the noisy subsystem. And so maybe starting with any state in the noisy subsystem is a way to, uh, is really the most general uh, thing to do in a real system. At least that's what we have. Okay, any more questions or comments? If not, let's give uh, Prabha and all the speakers of this session a big hand. Thank you.